It's the one-year anniversary of the January 6th riot at Capitol Hill. As expected, the left is capitalizing on this in every way they possibly can, exaggerating it and saying just flat-out crazy things. We'll take a look at it in tonight's Hold the Line. Welcome to Hold the Line. I'm Buck Sexton. We can all agree that riots are bad, right? Well, actually, no, we can't because the left won't com condemn their own riots. But they hate it when, on occasion, people associated with the right step out of line, break the law, and riot. And that occurred with some percentage of what was otherwise, you could say, a mostly peaceful protest on January 6th. But there was a contingent that became violent against police and destroyed property went inside the Capitol building and gave an enormous gift to their political opponents on the left in the process. This was a blunder, but that's what it was, a riot that was quelled, and then the Congress went about its business. Everybody on the right of any standing condemned this, said it was a bad thing to do. But was it the darkest day in America's recent history in, say, 20 years? Does it harken back to the most catastrophic attacks in the history of our republic? According to Vice President Kamala Harris, yes, it does. This was her this morning. Certain dates echo throughout history, including dates that instantly remind all who have lived through them where they were and what they were doing when our democracy came under assault. Dates that occupy not only a place on our calendars, but a place in our collective memory. December 7th, 1941, September 11th, 2001, and January 6th, 2021. Yeah, September 11th, Pearl Harbor, January 6th. 2,400 plus Americans were killed by Imperial Japan in a sneak attack as part of their alliance with Nazi Germany as they were trying to take over the world and have us all descend into totalitarianism and fascism and the genocidal mania of the Nazi regime controlling the entire Western world in the process. Uh, that's what we face then. QAnon shaman and some other people who, yes, should not have been in the Capitol, but many of them were taking selfies. Many of them stayed within the boundaries of the velvet rope line in the uh, statuary hall. That is not the same thing. They're not allowed to get away with saying these are the same degree and level of crimes. Jaywalking is not first degree murder. You can say they're both criminal acts, but they are not comparable. And to say that what happened on January 6th is in any way comparable to 9-11, where almost 3,000 Americans were murdered in a terror attack. Those incidents, by the way, Pearl Harbor and 9-11 led to major wars in which Thousands, tens of thousands of people lost their lives soon afterwards. Who lost lives on the actual day of January 6th? Ashley Babbitt, an unarmed female protester who was shot in the neck by a Capitol Hill police officer with a history of poor conduct. So why are we seeing these comparisons made? Because this is about politics, as you know. And this is about Joe Biden making sure that people don't think they're allowed to, it's socially acceptable to speak out in favor of, say, Donald Trump running again, or to think that it's okay to be a part of the Republican Party, really, trying to paint with a very broad brush. Here's Biden comparing the riots, in fact, to the Civil War. Well, here is the God's truth about January 6, 2021. Close your eyes. Go back to that day. What do you see? Rioters rampaging, waving for the first time inside this Capitol, Confederate flag that symbolized the cause to destroy America, to rip us apart. Even during the Civil War, that never, ever happened. But it happened here in 2021. Yes, a conflict in which hundreds of thousands of Americans lost their lives in the Civil War uh, and countless more were grievously wounded. That's somehow comparable to a couple of uh, imbeciles unfolding flags while they're walking around inside a building before they were escorted out and then arrested. 
Yeah, that, that's a fair comparison to make. That makes a lot of sense if you are reckless and a liar and absurd. But let's really get to this. A big part of it all is they say that, the, that Trump would not accept the election results. And there were a lot of disputes over, these, uh, over this recent election. There are people that are, were very concerned. The Democrats did change rules. They changed laws. I would argue, in some cases, illegally changed rules in places like Pennsylvania in order to help their side win. But let's also understand that Democrats have a long history of rejecting elections themselves. They cannot be taken seriously on this point because we have access to the tapes, if you will. Here's Kamala Harris, February 2019, saying that, yeah, Donald Trump is an illegitimate president. He didn't actually win. He wasn't duly elected. Watch. Elections matter. When you win an election, you get to set the rules. How can you win with Russian interference, though? That's, That's a real thing. That's what I'm scared about no, in 2020. But, but rightly. Because right. I think he's an illegitimate president that didn't really win. So how do you, you know, fight against that in 2020? You are absolutely right. So, again, as a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, I will tell you that we should believe exactly what the intelligence community has told us, which is Russia did interfere in the election of the president of the United States in 2016. Hmm. So she's allowed to say that. They're allowed to make these claims of illegitimacy of a president, and it somehow is just fine. And if you say, oh, well, it's just Kamala Harris who says that, no, that's not true. Here's Joe Biden in April of 2019. Watch. He's an illegitimate president in my mind. That's it. I, I think all the talk about impeachment and what the Democrats should do, that's fine. It's theoretical at this point. Let them investigate. Let them subpoena. Let them go to the Supreme Court. He's illegitimate. And my biggest fear is that he's going to do it again with the help of Vlad, his best pal, and we're going to be stuck for six more years with this guy. And that is terrifying. It's terrifying. Would you be my vice president for Canada? <laughs> but... Folks, look, I absolutely agree. Hmm. Yeah. It's fine to just go along with all that stuff, sure. Uh, look, we all understand what's going on here. We know that the left is okay with violence that their side engages in. We saw the BLM riots all throughout the summer of June of 2020, and they weren't condemned by the left. They were elevated. They were saying, no, this is what happens when an oppressed people speaks out. So we had to have loons from Antifa running around, throwing rocks at cops, bottles of urine, uh, lasers in their eyes trying to blind them. But that was all okay because of what happened to George Floyd. It was necessary. That's what they told us. These people have no moral authority for this. They have no right to be lecturing the rest of the country about political violence. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida spoke well on this issue today. He's just saying, look, they're obsessed, and this is pathetic. Watch. I think it's going to end up being just a politicized Charlie Foxtrot today. Um, I don't expect anything good to come out of anything that Pelosi and the gang are doing. I don't expect anything from the, the corporate press to be enlightening. Um, I think it's going to be nauseating, quite frankly. There is an obsession with this amongst the D.C. New York uh, uh, journalist class. And again, I think it's because it allows them to spin a narrative um, that, that they want to spin. They did not care as much uh, about what happened after 2016 when you had a false Russia collusion conspiracy theory that was put on for years because they were involved when doing it and how that may have damaged trust in institutions or all that. He's absolutely right. We'll have more on the anniversary of the January 6th riot, this new left-wing commemoration, holiday, whatever they're going to call it, with senior writer for National Review, David Harsanyi, coming up. Stay with us. One year ago today, in this sacred place, democracy was attacked, <clears throat> simply attacked. The will of the people was under assault. The Constitution, our Constitution, faced the gravest of threats. Democracy was attacked. Yeah, that was Joe Biden during his speech today, commemorating the January 6th riot. Today's events were part of a broader, ongoing effort to convince voters that Republicans are attempting to literally end democracy through changes to voter laws. Oh, okay. Earlier this week, Congressman Eric Swalwell warned that if Republicans win in 2022, it could be America's last election. Take a look. 
Chris, I'm worried that if Republicans uh, win in the midterm elections, uh, that voting as we know it in this country uh, will be gone. They're already putting as many barriers to the ballot box as possible in Arizona, Florida, Texas, Georgia. And on the other side of the finish line, they're putting in place processes where they could reverse the outcome, even if we crawl through glass and run through the fire to get to the ballot box. And so uh, if they are able to win the House, uh, the damage they could do, uh, you know, to permanently uh, make it difficult to vote and, and just alter the way that we participate in a democratic process uh, could be irreversible. Joining me now is senior writer for National Review, David Harsanyi. David, thanks for joining us to try to create some sanity in an insane world. What's going on? <laughs> Well, I'm not even sure what he was talking about there because <laughs> elections are state are state issues right now. They are the ones who want to federalize elections. They are the ones who want to tell states how to act. It's very hard to cheat when you have 50 different elections, but yet he's saying the House is going to change. How is the House going to change election law in Florida, where you know they actually have a relatively good system right right now? I just I don't even understand what he's talking about. It's just pure scaremongering. It strikes me that this is a, a classic maneuver we see from the uh, Democrat Party these days, and that is that, that there's an issue, they've, they're very emotional, and they uh, have a lot of hyperbole and exaggeration around it, as they do today, you know, the insurrection, a threat to our democracy, a dagger at the neck of our democracy, is I think what Joe Biden said this morning during his speech, as if unarmed protesters, um, some of whom were harmless, others were idiots attacking police, but as if they're going to overthrow the United States government and this is really a serious thing. Uh, but then they immediately pivot to, oh, but this is actually about a voting rights issue. And so if we lose the midterms, then democracy is in peril. It, it, it's like, what, what does one have to do with the other exactly other than, oh, Democrats aren't allowed to lose? Well, that's what it is. They want to exert unilaterally exert power. And when they can't, they uh, want to change the system. I mean, listen, I'm not saying that the intentions of Chuck Schumer are the same as some crazy rioter, right? But the bottom line is he has far more power. And what he wants to do is a bigger threat to constitutional order than anyone who was there that day was. And uh, we should be able to talk about that. He wants to eliminate the filibuster because he wants majoritarian rule with you know the slimmest of majorities you can have in the Senate to change how we the elections are unconstitutionally change how elections are conducted in this country that is a bigger threat to the constitution than anything those guys did i'm not i'm not defending those rioters um, i'm just telling you that that's in the past and right now there's a far bigger threat to the constitution biden by the way is is running with this notion that it's republicans who are the ones who don't accept losing. Here's what he said during the speech this morning. You can't love your country only when you win. You can't obey the law only when it's convenient. You can't be patriotic when you embrace and enable lies. Those who storm this Capitol and those who instigated and incited and those who called on them to do so held a dagger at the throat of America. Oh, there we go. There's the dagger at the throat of America line. Uh, these are the same Democrats who have elevated the Russia collusion lie for years, suggesting very explicitly that Donald Trump did not win the 2016 election. They actually had a special counsel I and mean, they tried to use the government to undo the elected portion of the executive branch of the government. And now we have to have lectures about being sore losers. I mean, never mind Al Gore back in 2000. They got quite a, or, or Stacey Abrams in Georgia. I could go all day. Yeah, I mean, it takes an immense, astronomical amount of chutzpah to say, to lecture people about not accepting the results of an election when you use the government of the United States to undermine people's um, you know, trust in the electoral process, to convince 67% of Democrats that Russian gremlins had gotten into voting machines and changed their votes, which was, which was what you know, the level of uh, Democrats who thought that, the election, that their votes had literally been stolen and to come out there. And you notice that he conflates, first he talks about the rioters and then it's people who incited them and then it's people who told them to do it. Can you name me someone who told anyone to go out and riot that day in the Republican Party? All I've heard after were con condemnations from most people. I'm not saying there aren't idiots out there, but there's a vast amount of people. I saw a poll today that said only 4% of Republicans thought that the violence was justified. That's a very small fraction of, of people. 
And yet we pretend they conflate all these things because they want to pass this legislation. That's what this is all about. And uh, it is it is the threat to the Constitution. And and speaking of some of the exaggerations today and just I mean, it's really shameless. I mean, people can frame issues in their own way. And obviously we're in a media environment that is effectively just warring propaganda machines to begin with. But there should be some limits to it. And here is, I mean, I remember this guy from when I used to do CNN hits back before CNN completely lost its mind and essentially banned all conservatives from its channel. Uh, here's uh, David Brinkley, who is a historian and, and a loon, by the way, uh, comparing not just January 6th to Pearl Harbor and 9-11, but let's just throw the Holocaust in there. Watch. We have film footage of what happened on January 6th. We have proof. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower during World War II made sure all the Holocaust camps were filmed. So we've got the film footage. So now we're combating conspiracy theorists, deniers, and some, um, and, you know, trumpeteers. But the, my worry is what do we call this and make sure we, we honor this day, this dark stained day every year. So we've got to keep saying January 6th. I think it is like December 7th, Pearl Harbor, and it is like the 9-11 um, tragedy. And I'm sorry, he brought in the Holocaust there. But Pearl Harbor, 9-11, yeah, that's what they're saying. I don't know what to say about this anymore. I mean, it is the lack of proportionality in how people think about these things because they're so self-centered. They think their political world is the most important things are happening now. The idea that we were not even close in any way to having the government of the United States overthrown. That's just simply a lie. It never was going to happen. Not one judge sided with Trump, not one official over try to overturn the, the, the results. It did not happen. Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying that, you know, I think Donald Trump did a lot wrong there. I think the things he said were wrong. I think he should have acted in a different way. Um, but you're not allowed to say that anymore because they'll just say you're diminishing January 6th. Like you say it's bad. They're like, no, it's Pearl Harbor. You're like, no, it's not Pearl. No, it's the Holocaust now. I mean, yeah, I and mean, he didn't exactly say that, but it was pretty close. I mean, right? bringing so, the Holocaust um, into the conversation is outrageous. Okay, it's outrageous. Even 9/11. I mean, 9/11. You know, 3,000 Americans died. It was just a tra anyone who was alive then knows what a traumatic event it was. This is not the same thing. It was an ugly event. It was a riot. Uh, someone had mentioned. I think it was Molly Ball. Some reporter had mentioned that if the if they if there had been better security at the Capitol that day, this day would just have been remembered as an ugly um, protest. It would have been no more because it was not a coup. Even the FBI doesn't say it was a coup. There is no evidence. I have not seen any evidence from the commission that it was a a planned, concerted effort to overthrow the United States government. That's just. But yet they all say it on every network. They just constantly say it as if that's a fact. David, thanks for some sanity. Good to see you. You too. Thanks for having me. Despite some of the strictest public health measures in the world, including so-called remote quarantine camps, Australia is seeing a massive rise in COVID-19 cases. The land, land Down Under is now a COVID totalitarianism cautionary tale. I'll explain all this in tonight's Buck Brief. But first, I want to talk to you about protecting your online data. A lot of companies promise you that privacy is guaranteed, but you know that's not true. That's why you need a new privacy and cybersecurity application tool called Secure. It's spelled S-E-K-U-R. Secure is using proprietary encryption and offering secure instant messaging and email. All of your comms with Secure are on servers overseas hosted in Switzerland. Privacy is a big issue now. Without real security, people can read your emails, messages, even your bank information. Secure will never mine your data, never ask you for your phone number. They will protect your privacy online. Secure is your solution. The constant theft of your digital identity it costs only $5 for the messenger, only $10 for the messenger and email combination package. Go to secure.com and take back your privacy today. That's S-E-K-U-R.com. Use promo code BUCK for 25% off. We'll be right back with more. Hold the line. If you've been paying any attention to what's going on in Australia, you've probably noticed the country has all but abandoned any pretense of freedom. Australian citizens are subjected to harsh lockdowns and in some instances relocated to COVID camps against their will. It's all under the guise of safety against a virus that has a more than 99% survival rate to begin with, according to medical professionals, health experts, and all the data that we have. Meanwhile, the measures have done little to actually slow the spread of the virus as cases continue to surge. The land down under has turned itself into a cautionary tale for COVID totalitarianism, Let's break it all down in the Buck Brief. We 
We used to think of Australia as like the UK with perhaps slightly less pretentious people, better weather, and kangaroos. But really what we're finding out is that it's more like the gulag with koalas. They're locking people up. This is crazy. They're putting them in camps to protect people from COVID. This makes absolutely no sense. And then on top of it all, it's not working. Australia COVID-19 cases are surging right now, overloading their testing system, despite all the massive actual lockdowns. They have real lockdowns in Australia. Very strict policing of these policies as well. Today, Australia reported 547,160 cases and 2,270 deaths. This for a country that is an island, separated from much of the rest of the world, of course, and its airline travel has been shut down for long periods of time. They have tried to turn into Fortress Australia against COVID. And for a while, it seemed to work, but here's the problem. Eventually, you have to reintegrate yourself into the global community and you don't have natural immunity built up among your population because they haven't been infected. You have a vaccine that, as we know, doesn't stop the spread, not even close, and isn't that effective after a few months period of time. So given all of these realities, are they changing at all their approach into the way they handle this issue? Are they taking a step back to say, we shall learn from our mistakes and we shall do what is necessary to protect people without unnecessarily trampling on their most basic rights. No, of course not. Here is the Minister of the Northern Territory of Australia, Michael Gunner. I don't know Australia that well, but here he is, who is essentially telling you, if you are, keep in mind, not if you have COVID, this is a very important distinction. If you are unvaccinated, that's right, just for being unvaxxed, you are not allowed to leave except for shopping, medical treatment, or essential caregiving to a relative. Watch this. The fully vaccinated can continue as they were. For people who are not vaccinated, lockdown rules will apply to everyone 16 and above. If you are not fully vaxxed, stay home. You are at greater risk of catching COVID, becoming ill and needing hospital care. You may only leave home for three reasons. Medical treatment, including COVID testing or vaccination for essential goods and services like groceries, power tokens, medications, to provide care and support to a family member or person who cannot support themselves. You cannot travel more than 30 kilometers from your home when leaving for one of the three reasons or the nearest practical destination. I mean, restrictions on why you can leave your home, how far from your home you can stray, all of this. What the heck? is going on here. Well, let's remember it was Australia that actually had its own military at one point, transferring positive COVID cases, individuals who happen to be sick with COVID, which as we know, I mean, tons of people get COVID all the time, all the time. I've had COVID, I'm sure most of you watching have had COVID, but they act like, oh my gosh, if we don't do all these things, a lot of people are gonna get COVID. A lot of people are going to, irrespective of their dumbass rules. And here's the military transferring people to Australian quarantine camps because, you know, they're crazy. These are strong measures, but the threat to lives is extreme. An expanded rapid assessment team was deployed to Binjari and Rockhole last night to help with the hard lockdown, begin the contact tracing work and provide as much support as possible to residents. I contacted the Prime Minister last night. We are grateful for the support of about 20 ADF personnel as well as army trucks to assist with the transfer of positive cases and close contacts and to support the communities. We are doing an assessment today of what extra resources we might need from the Feds and the Prime Minister is ready to help further. I thank him and the Australian Government for that. Military transferring COVID positive cases. Um, now this is back in the whole Australia situation is back in the news because the Number one tennis player in the world, Novak Djokovic, uh, was given a visa to go there. Initially, he was allowed to go. He had an exemption from the vaccine, which, you know, let's be honest. I mean, it's because it's he's important that they gave him the exemption in the first place. But now they've said, oh, no, 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 no. The rules are the rules. So here is Aussie's health minister announcing Novak Djokovic, no tennis in Australia for you, sir. Not without the shot. The visa for Novak Djokovic has been cancelled. Uh, obviously, that uh, follows a review of the exemption which was provided through the Victorian government process. They were looking at the uh, 
uh, integrity and the evidence behind it. Um, the advice I have, and if I can just quote it for you, is the ABF can confirm that Mr Djokovic failed to provide appropriate evidence to meet the entry requirements to Australia and visa has been subsequently cancelled. So it's a matter for him whether he wishes to uh, appeal that, but uh, if a visa is cancelled, somebody will have to leave the country. If a visa is cancelled, somebody has to leave the country. You don't say. Here's the mother of Novak Djokovic, by the way, saying they're keeping him as a prisoner. As a mother, uh, what can I say? If you are a mother, you can just imagine how, you, how can I feel. I feel uh, terrible since yesterday, last 24 hours, that they are keeping him as a prisoner. It's just not fair. It's not human. So I just hope that he will be strong, as we are trying also to, to be very strong, to give him some energy to keep on going. I hope that he will win. COVID mass hysteria all over the world. People need to grow up, deal with reality. Former Daily Show host Jon Stewart taking a little heat after walking back comments. I guess he took heat and then walked it back. In which he appeared to accuse author J.K. Rowling of anti-Semitism. We'll have more on that with the First TV's Rob Smith coming up. Jon Stewart apparently has a problem, or does he, with J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. The former Daily Show host has questioned the controversial author's use of what he called an anti-Semitic trope in her goblin characters. What? Take a look. She did not, yeah. in a wizarding world, just throw Jews in there <laughs> to run the f***ing underground bank. You ever see the scenes in Gringotts Bank? And they're like, I love the scenes in Gringotts Bank. He's like, do you know what those folks that run the bank are? And they're like, what? And they're like, Jews. I just want to show you a caricature. And they're like, oh, look at that. That's from Harry Potter. And you're like, no, yeah. that's a caricature of a Jew from an anti-Semitic piece of literature. J.K. Rowling was like, can we get these guys to run our bank? Uh, yeah. Rowling, the famed author, billionaire author, in fact, has caused a stir with her comments about the transgender community having nothing to do with uh, this issue that Jon Stewart's talking about, but LGBTQ activists have blasted her for inflammatory rhetoric. So is she now just someone that has to be targeted even with smears by people who are on the left? For more on this, we bring in Rob Smith, host of the podcast Rob Smith is Problematic. Rob, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Anytime, Buck. So, okay. Because we're, 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 we're honest here, right? We'll tell people what's really going on. That clip that we showed, that aired in December. Since mm -hmm. then, Stewart, who was a comedian slash propagandist for the left for many years, an effective one, took to social media to correct how he feels or what he says about Rowling and the Harry Potter franchise. Let's watch this and then we'll, we'll dive into this together. I do not think J.K. Rowling is anti-Semitic. I did not accuse her of being anti-Semitic. I do not think that the Harry Potter movies are anti-Semitic. I really love the Harry Potter movies, probably too much for a gentleman of my considerable age. Uh, so I would just like to say that none of that is true and not a reasonable person could not have looked at that conversation and not found it lighthearted. I cannot stress this enough. I'm not accusing J.K. Rowling of being anti-Semitic. She need not answer to any of it. I don't want the Harry Potter movies censored in any way. Uh, it was a lighthearted conversation. Get a f grip. I actually, I, I don't think it was a lighthearted conversation. I think that he's trying to gaslight everybody right now. I, and unless I missed something, it's, I mean, was that, what was funny about what he said the first time around? I, I missed that. Well, so this is what I think is happening right here. I think that when they were having that conversation, the initial December conversation, it was it was humorous, right? I, I think that he was kind of just joking a little bit. But what you have to understand is that now J.K. Rowling is a target of the left because of her comments about transgender women but and basically her belief um, in biological sex. I have read every single thing that, that J.K. Rowling has said on this issue. It is nothing crazy. It is nothing outrageous. It is just not what the far left wants pushed, right? So she is a target. So what Newsweek did was they found a 
three minute clip from a two month, a month old podcast or whatever, and tried to gin up this idea that J.K. Rowling is now an anti Semite, right? Because we already know, quote unquote, that she is a transphobe. So now she's an anti Semite too. And so what this is, and, and I'm glad that John Stewart kind of nipped this, nipped this in the butt, but what he doesn't understand is that the word, the left that he was a part of when he was in his heyday has completely morphed. And he doesn't understand um, that these people go for blood now, they want to cancel everybody. And um, this is him kind of like pushing back on that a little bit. But I don't want to give him too much kudos for this because this is a part of the monster that he has created. Yeah, but but also, I mean, just so you think that he was, I mean, he says lighthearted conversation. Okay, he's having a relaxing podcast conversation with folks. Was that supposed to be a joke? Like, I, I don't, what's the joke? He's saying J.K. Rowling, how is, that, how is that funny what he said about J.K. Rowling putting uh, Jews as running the bank? And uh, like, I, that's not funny. So I, I don't understand. Well, He's a comedian. He knows that's John, not funny. Well, John Stewart is Jewish, correct? Yeah, he, he was, looked like he was complaining about what happened. I mean, it looks yeah, like he was calling no. her out. No, I think that what it was, okay, as a, as a member of a minor, of two minority communities myself, I think that sometimes you just, you, there, it's just lighthearted stuff that you say, oh, well, look at that. Uh -huh. Oh, you know what that is. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't think that it wasn't serious. Um, and if John Stewart is, is Jewish, which I think that he is, he is, yes, he's, he is definitely he's Jewish. We could establish he is Jewish, Jewish yes. Okay, so, so we've established that he is Jewish. I think that he was just having a little laugh at maybe his own expense. This was obviously nothing that JK Rowling thought. I think he was kind of just like, um, it, it was, he was telling a little self-deprecating joke, I think. A little, a little laugh at the expense of his own community, right? And when you are in that community, you can laugh at that, right? But I think that the humorless left took that as something that it wasn't completely blew it up in an attempt to further destroy and cancel J.K. Rowling, hmm. and then he came out against that. So I think that is what's going on here. That's, that's a, lot, a lot of nuanced cultural analysis, which I appreciate. I, I, I didn't think, it didn't seem to me like it was, like he was making, it's not funny if it was a joke. So that's why I don't really understand what the purpose of well, it was. But I get you're saying it was. Well, the thing about it is, is that if you're not Jewish, you can't laugh at it. It's like if I'm with my black friends and we're telling self-deprecating jokes about that, like we can laugh at it, but you can't. I think it's kind of like one of those things. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Well, well speaking of people who can't laugh at things or can't actually have just a normal cultural conversation anymore, Patton Oswalt, he has bent the knee to the woke mob after writing an apology for posting a picture with his longtime friend Dave Chappelle. Not allowed to be in a picture with Dave Chappelle, apparently. Oswald wrote a groveling apology in the form of an essay because he, like I said, was in this photo with Chappelle. Here's just a snippet of what he wrote. I'm an LGBTQ ally. I'm a loyal friend. I'm sorry, truly sorry that I didn't consider the hurt this would cause or the depth of that hurt. I mean, this is embarrassing. You're, you're not allowed to be in a photo with your friend Dave Chappelle, the most successful comedian and black comedian, but you know, comedian in general, I think you say across all categorizations of his generation. Yeah, you know, Buck, it's pathetic, and it makes it even more pathetic when you realize that. And I and I read that um, that message that Patton Oswalt had posted that he and Chappelle have been friends since their teens. Okay, that's a long time because these are not young men. So we are in the age right now where you cannot take a friend with, you cannot take a photo with a friend that you have had for decades at this point without having to apologize to nameless, faceless avatars on Twitter who are quote unquote outraged. And we say this all the time, but these entertainers and these Hollywood celebrities need to stop apologizing to the woke mob on Twitter. These people do not want your sincere, sincere apologies. These people do not want your regret. Well, what these people want is your submission. And by apologizing, Patton Oswalt has basically sent them the sign that they now own him, that he had better toe the line, and he had better not publicly take a photo with or support his friend of decades, Dave Chappelle, or else he will be apologizing all over again. And I wonder what that conversation was behind the scenes, what the private conversation between Patton Oswalt and Dave Chappelle was, what I would think is that they both knew that the apology was BS, but that for his career, Patton Oswalt had to do it. And but can I just remind everybody, here's Patton Oswalt real quick during a stand-up skit 
comparing trans people to clowns. Watch. Because we're also going to have men in bright clothing and makeup. Up, oh, time out. You mean like, like transvestites, right? Well, technically, yes, but they're going to keep going so that they're clowns. You realize a clown is just a transvestite that doesn't stop. Like if you, like if you, if you saw a guy in lipstick and eyeshadow, you'd be like, Timmy, leave him alone. That's his own thing. And the guy's like, oh no, hang on. Woo! Like, oh, Timmy, get he's a wonderful clown. I mean, I just think it's interesting. He doesn't, that's not what bothers him as an ally of the LGBTQ community. Posing for a photo with Dave Chappelle, that's what's too far. Yeah, and the thing about this uh, apology is that if he did not make that apology uh, as groveling as it was, the left would have found that clip, blown it up, um, and then you know they're you know uh, glad or any of these organizations will be calling for boycotts from whatever it is that Patton Oswalt does right now. Rob, good to see you. Thanks for the perspective, my friend. All right, Buck, take it easy. Coming up. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul takes a stand against big tech, and the White House is once again lying about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. They have DeSantis envy. We have those stories for you in quick hits. Stay with us. The White House is lying about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, and Senator Rand Paul takes a stand against big tech. We have those stories on tonight's quick hits for your viewing enjoyment. But let's, uh, let's first start with this. Uh, Ron DeSantis has put on a clinic for the rest of, honestly, the country, but certainly for the libs, the Democrats, and how they run their states of what a rational, reasonable policy in the era of COVID is. And the results speak for themselves. People are all moving to Florida. People go there for vacation, like me. Other people are moving there permanently because Florida's doing it right. The White House has DeSantis envy. They get upset about this because they would like to pretend like they follow the science and they know what they're doing. Here is Jen Psaki falsely claiming that Ron DeSantis, in fact, has not advocated for people to get vaccinated. Uh, I would say it's pretty rich coming from Governor DeSantis, given he is somebody who has been uh, advocating, uh, not exactly advocating for people in his state to get vaccinated, which uh, we know is the way that people can be protected, way that lives can be saved. And if he wants to be a constructive part of this process, then perhaps he should encourage what scientists say is the best way to save lives, prevent and reduce hospitalization. And that is getting vaccinated and getting boosted. Yeah, Ron DeSantis has been telling people to get vaccinated. He just won't make them get vaccinated. He also has been trying to get monoclonal antibodies in sufficient levels that they can help people with early treatment to prevent them from even having to go to the hospital. But the Biden administration, the federal government, decided to get its nose in the middle of all that and made the supply shortage in Florida happen for monoclonal antibodies. So, yeah, they find a way to mess up everything. Big tech is a fiefdom of left-wing interests, as you know. Senator Rand Paul has decided that he's quitting YouTube. He's sick of it. Here's what he says. You know, I'm tired of censorship. And, you know, they say Mark Twain used to say, everybody's complaining about the weather, but nobody's doing anything about it. Well, everybody on the right complains about social media and their censorship. Well, do something about it. Let's quit. So I'm no longer going to let some punk, some snot-nosed kid over at YouTube (laughs) decide that a speech that I gave on the Senate floor is not appropriate. Or that when I say cloth masks don't work because I'm trying to save lives, because if you go into the room with your grandparents and wearing a cloth mask, you're going to get infected. If an 80-year-old's taking care of their wife and they're wearing a cloth mask and their wife has COVID, they're going to get infected because the cloth masks don't work. Mm Mm-hmm. He's right. And he's right about big tech censorship and how we do have to take action. It's not enough to just continue to allow them to shut down ideas and voices that they, something that they don't like, that don't go along with their position of censorship. Speaking of uh, the vaccines, a New York teacher was arrested after she gave a 17-year-old kid the Johnson & Johnson vaccine without his parents' permission. Watch this. There you go, at home vaccine. At home vaccine. That's how this video obtained exclusively by News 4 starts. It ends with a woman giving a 17 year old boy whose face we have obscured what is believed to be a shot of the COVID 19 vaccine. Police say they arrested 54 year old Laura Russo for administering the shot from inside her Seacliff home. It's a very, very curious situation. 
Curious because Russo is not a medical professional and not authorized to administer vaccines. She's a science teacher at Herrick's High School. I mean, why would she do this? It seems so weird. Oh, this is really, as we've said, something like a religious belief for a lot of people on the left. Here's a girl on TikTok who decided to create the white supremacist insurrection jingle on the anniversary of the Capitol riot. I mean, we had to watch this, so I guess you have to watch this. How does a proud boy racist spawn of two first cousins breach the Capitol without a single scratch up on them? How did they emerge escorted by the police force while in summer Black Lives Matter protesters got treated much worse? Uh, yo, looks like they got a secret weapon. It's not Donald Trump and it is definitely not intelligence. It's constantly confusing, confounding, Caucasian fascist. Everyone give it up for America's oldest hidden practice. White privilege. That was awful, guys. I'm, I'm in a control room. You are on a timeout after that. After I had to watch that and our audience had to watch that, I'm sorry. I will, I will yell at them later. That is it for tonight's Hold the Line. The No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is next. Shields high.